just going to run you up with another one of uh, David Rowan's uh, predictions, his top 10 mega trends. So this is one. Business disruption is the new norm. I think that's such a cliche, but this is what he said eight years ago before it was a cliche. Business disruption is the new norm. Not only was Kodak the first household name in photography and a film for a century, it was Kodak who invented the first digital camera. They were hardly sticking their heads in the technological sand, but it wasn't enough. They're bankrupt. Instagram was an 18-employee company bought by Facebook for $1 billion. One year in, this is whenever it was, it was written, it has made no money. Was it worth it? Five years in, has it made any money? I don't know. It's done very well for Peony Roses this year. I've noticed you can't move for Peony Roses on Instagram. Nokia stood the smartphone industry on its head, uh, but dismissed the iPhone launch. And now, the que that back then it said, the question is, will it survive? And of course, as we know, it didn't. So who largely thinks that David Rowan got that right? Business disruption is the new norm. Show of hands, please. Oh, some of you. Not so many others. I think business disruption gets a lot of press, but actually a lot of our brands, a lot of our consumption habits are incredibly similar. So David didn't get our vote for that one. So moving on, change of pace to our second keynote speaker of the day. And remember I told you about my friend's daughter who wanted to literally think her way out the box. The next presenter might have been able to help her. Um, Professor Steve Benford of the Mixed Reality Lab at the University of Nottingham is gonna talk about playing with control. So breath controlled rides, brain controlled film. So she might not have been able to teleport out of the packing box, but it seems like she will be able to stop a, f stop a film on Netflix in its tracks if she just thinks hard enough. Well, that's if um, our next speaker has his way. He's our very own star man, waiting in the sky. Can we give Steve a very warm welcome? Thank you. Nice intro. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, uh, inviting me along to speak to you. Um, yeah, so uh, what am I? Um, so I'm a computer scientist, and uh, my particular field of endeavour is human-computer interaction. How how humans interact with computers, how to design that to be interesting and appropriate and new ways that, that, that might work. That's really what I do. But for 20 years or so, I've been doing that in, in a particular area, looking at cultural and creative uses of computing. That's my particular passion and, and working a great deal with artists as, as part of doing that. And I have a number of motivations for, for so doing. First of all, I believe that fundamentally that's a really important use of computers per se, that's my main motivation. But also, a bit sneakily, um, the people we've collaborated with have a fantastic sense of playfulness and creativity and push technologies to places that I think we, as a lab, certainly wouldn't have thought of taking them, and that, that's provocative for us. Um, and also, uh, being able to stage, perform, and tour artworks is a kind of living laboratory as well. It gives us an opportunity to field technologies and emerging ideas in a way that would be really quite difficult if you were working in, say, uh, medical science and, and medical practice. The other kind of question, I suppose, is implicit in that is how we do our work. So I guess we keep growing a process, and we, we still are, that's essentially practice-led. And you know, our collaborations date back uh, 20 years through uh, due our sort of longest running collaborator with Blast Theory, you know, who we are still working with on projects. And, and, and over that time, it, it's complicated, but it kind of works roughly like this. Quite often, not always, quite often we meet artists, they come to us wanting to make a project, something they want to realise. And our role is technologists. Uh, we try and build it for them uh, as much as we're, we're able to and to get it to a position where it's, it's able to go out in, into the world. And that's just practice-led. It seems like a great thing to make. We'd love to be involved. But then there's um, a pact with the devil, uh, and that's the study bit. So 
as researchers in HCR, we want, we want to crawl all over the rationale and the process and the thinking behind that and how audiences experience it. So there's no, nearly always a quid pro quo that involves writing some reflective kind of papers from our perspective, the sort of reflection we do. And then occasionally for that, we generalise. We try and generalise principles and those are principles more back into our own field. So when we're doing that, we're often speaking to other computer scientists, bringing messages from this other world, saying, oh, there, are, there are different ways to think about how people might interact with stuff that would disrupt how you think. Um, so anyway, in the talk, I thought I'd just give a bit of a sample of, uh, of that, drawing on just a couple of sort of recent projects. Uh, we'll look at the projects, talk about those, and then I'll do a bit of sort of reflecting on them from a, an HCI point of view, I suppose. Uh, and the particular focus I've chosen is um, thinking about playful control and embodied control, because that's a, a theme of work that seems to be coming up among the, the folks that we're working with a lot at the moment. So um, I, I could have spoken and control about a number of Blast Theory works that we've written about, and I could have spoken about Dai's work that she meant earlier, but She's spoken about that, and please go and try it. So I, I, as one example, I picked on a, um, Brendan Walker, who we've been working with since around about 2007, 2008. And the reason is because Brendan's work is very much about embodied physiological control of different kinds. And the journey started with Brendan saying, um, can you build a personal telemetry kit, please, so that when people ride roller coasters and other rides, I can capture their GSR and their heart rate and video and audio, and that can be performed. Um, I think the idea in his head was, you know, why shouldn't the parents see their, their, their children's terror the first time they go on Nemesis at Alton Towers and vicariously uh, share in that, that thrill in some way? But... Just kind of projecting that and capturing it didn't feel like quite enough. So the next piece of work with Brendan started to think about how you use that physiological data to control the ride. So one of the early experiments that we kind of got into was, um, was this beast, uh, which is um, just a simple experiment near our lab. It's a breath-controlled bucking bronco. So you're on a bronchomatic ride. It's going to throw you off at the end anyway, because that's what happens on Broncos. But the more you breathe, the more it moves. But also to score points, the more you have to breathe. So it sets up a tension between wanting to breathe, not wanting to breathe. Uh, the ride goes through three levels. When we took it out into public spaces, there'd be a big countdown as it got harder and harder. And the breathing in this case is kind of chest strap measured. So, um, yes, we kind of rolled this out various places. I think the main one was at the National Video Game Arcade in Nottingham. We had quite a few thousand people ride it in the end. Um, and we did a bunch of studies. We unpacked Brendan's design rationale. In this case, we were also able to make use of data as well as interviewing people. So we captured all of the, the, the breathing patterns from people, and we interviewed those that we could about what were they doing, how were they playing the game, how did it feel. And we uncovered a range of tactics, really interesting. Um, quite a few people try to control their breathing. Not that many, but a number said, quite a few said things like, I practice yoga, I practice shooting, martial arts, I've been taught how to control my breathing, so I try to bring that to bear on the ride. Remember, everybody falls off at the end. Um, a classic tactic was to hold one's breath, particularly at the moment where the ride tips up to the next level. The voice goes, we're going up to level two, three, two, one, and people go, I'll just try and keep it under control. That's, that's the killer moment in this experience. That's the point where you can only hold your breath for so long, and you sit there and you figure that out for yourself. You can see people thinking, oh, shit, I'm holding my breath, I'm going to let it go in a minute, and when I do, I'm going to go, ah, and at that point, things are going to kick off. So that's, that's a really interesting moment, this little sense of self-awareness of, of your breathing. And there were other things. Some people just held on, as this breathing pattern shows. Uh, the breathing gets crazy at the end. I mean, this person just forgot about breathing. They just held it like an egg, this ride, and rode it until it threw them off. Uh, and so their breathing goes crazy because the chest straps throwing them around, and it's a human in the, the loop robotic system. And some people, when they read it a few, rode a few times, were pretty systematic and figured out that, um, yeah, if I breathe a lot at the beginning, I get lots of points. But even then, they would hyperventilate and fall off. So, you know, it's... Either way, you lose. 
So um, Brendan got really interested in breathing. So the next step up was a, a breath controlled swing ride. And the breathing this time is through a gas mask, um, which added a bit more self-awareness of, uh, of your own breathing and your own control over what's going on. Um, and then um, I guess the most recent work I'll talk about with Brendan is also embodied control, but it's not breathing, this is something different. But I want to mention this because you can try it out for yourself at some Docklands uh, Greenwich Festival at the moment, and it was in Norwich a few weeks ago. And this is VR. We're, we're all back to VR, and it's kind of nice for us to go back to VR and do a view VR, try out a few VR projects. So this is embodied control of virtual worlds via the medium of a playground swing, or the mechanism. So it's a little bit of a quick documentary video to give you a sense of what it's like physically. Uh, there's always like a little bit of knowing you're on the swing, just so you, know, you don't want to make sure you fall off or anything like that. But, so uh, yeah, the basic thing is that there's a series of playground yeah. swings, up to six of these. Uh, you've also got sensors on people's heads because they're wearing a helmet, but you've also got sensors on the swing seat so you know how much the swing is swinging. And then they experience four different virtual worlds that map the swinging onto the graphics in their head now in different ways, from the relatively simplistic to the frankly quite disturbingly bonkers. So, for example, um, when, when, you, when you leave the ride, everybody gets a, uh, a souvenir uh, for each ride you go on. You take your ticket and you log online and it shows you, lets you relive your ride. So this was me riding... Uh, Walker, by the looks of it, which is um, the horriblest of the four, to be honest. Uh, I should have shown you another one. This is a bad choice. Um, oh, hang on. Oh, no, sorry. This is a, I'm going to show you a better one. Sorry, that's Walker. Uh, he's riding Walker. Poor fool. Um, this is my souvenir. So uh, this, this is a bit more explanatory. This is the uh, beginner ride, if you like. Uh, and it, it, it's pretty simple. It maps, maps your swim, swinging just onto linear acceleration. So you're on a linear path in the world, but every time you swing back, you get a little kick uh, forward and it starts to speed up with your swinging. So you kind of get this you know, little pit of your stomach moment, which you get when you're swinging anyway, enhanced by the visuals. Uh, the music reacts and so on. So what's interesting, I guess, is that Brendan's playing, and what's interesting from my point of view, is that Brendan's playing with a sort of systematic disalignment or decoupling of your kinesthetic and your visual and auditory senses. And he's taking that relationship, and initially it's pretty stable, and then he's right, he, he tries to see how he can decouple that and what sort of experience it can give you. His background is things like vertigo play and, and kind of getting... Um, So not a lot more happens, you get a sense of it. You're really at this point now starting to get a bit of a, a pit of the stomach kind of feeling every time you, you swing. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll just pick on kind of one more example and then we'll kind of get to the other bit, which is, so what does that make me think as a, from my role as a computer scientist? But the other example I quickly wanted to mention is um, uh, an artist called uh, Richard Ramchun. Uh, who's also a PhD student now at, at Nottingham as well. And Richard's interested in uh, brain-controlled cinema. So he's, he's made and toured one film, The Disadvantages of Time Travel, that use EEG to try and control some kind of interactive effect in a movie. And he's currently kind of taking the lessons from that and shooting his second film. I'll show you again a quick video just to give you a sense of what it looks like. Um, the video is very, very self-promotional, so try not to read anything that comes up on the screen, but just a, it's the trailer, basically, so it's allowed to be self-promotional. But I just want to cut to the point where we can see enough of the film. Nice caravan. Okay. 
Um, so it's taking a commercial off-the-shelf EEG device, a Neurosky, um, and yeah, mapping it onto a film that mixes and cuts different video layers uh, according to various things that you sense from uh, EEG, which is a pretty spongy signal coming off of someone's brain. So the structure of the film is something like the following. It's always 17 minutes long. It's always the same story, but it's shot in four different video layers. Two of them correspond to reality that the protagonist is experiencing. It's a film about bullying, um, uh, uh, and childhood. Two of them correspond to dreamlike stuff that's going on in the protagonist's head at the same time. And you're always cutting back and forward between these. And the mechanism for that cut is blinking. So every time you, op you blink and you open your eyes again, you've shifted from uh, reality to dream or from dream back to reality. The story's continuing, but your perspective. And then within that, um, in a rather complex way, your attention in one of the, when you're in one of the states controls just the mix of video layers. There's two video layers at a time in each of those states, or your uh, meditation. So whether how much you're attending or, or relaxed sort of, in a fuzzy way, controls the mixing. And again, quite a data-driven approach, so it's interesting. A question we could debate later on is data-driven creativity and data science, why not every... Other industry seems to be looking at people's data to try and factor out what's going on. So in this case, we're obviously able to take people's blinking and meditation data and try and figure out what was going on. Interesting, as you, people have a... Blinking's interesting, it's a bit like breathing, isn't it? Um, some people clearly refraining from blinking in order to either stick with the scene um, that they, they wanted to see. Uh, hold, not blinking for two minutes is good going. That's pretty intense. Um, and other people would blink to get away from something that they didn't particularly want to see, they felt, and they would blink away from that scene. Um, and, and some people, like with breathing, just, you know, you couldn't stop yourself blinking. and became very aware of their blinking, of course. Why wouldn't you? Um, attention and meditation were much more spongy as to, to who understood what was going on there, including us, um, because they're pretty ill-defined concepts in the, the first place. But, you know, there's some evidence in the statistic that something's going on with the, the attention. Um, people certainly had lots of stories to tell about what they thought was going on. It was kind of interesting. So I'm very conscious of time. I, I could talk for a lot longer about the works. Um, but I guess what I'd like to do is just kind of give a sense of, you know, because this morning's panel was about the kind of, you know, arts, science, although... We're not scientists, computer scientists. You can tell we're not scientists because we've got the word science in the title, like social science, Christian science, yeah. computer science, okay? So it's a clue that it's not science. Um, uh, so we're not scientists, but, but we are obviously interested in interpreting what's going on here and bringing it back into our own world and saying to people who design interfaces at large, hey, this is weird. What's happening? And, and what could the rest of us think about as a result? So one way we do this is we abstract. Computer science actually as a discipline is all about abstraction and generalization. That's what computer scientists are trained to do. And um, here's an abstraction of, of those various works. So one of the things that's interesting about them is to what extent is control voluntary in these systems? And that means control of the system, of the technology. But in these cases, it also means control of yourself, your own body. To what extent can you actually control your autonomic as well as your cognitive responses to, to what's going on here. So, to, so the nature of voluntariness is, 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 is quite interesting. So yeah, uh, you know, sometimes you choose to blink, you choose to swing, you choose to breathe. It's a bit like normal stuff. Your cognitive motor system, you think, you act, it happens. Um, but other times the system is autonomous, it's doing stuff, you're in Brendan's uh, ride, you're on a trajectory, the film has its own narrative, you're going there, the Bronco is going to throw you off. So the system is also in control. It, it's controlling the end game, the overall narrative. And then somewhere in the middle is this stuff I said about your aut autonomic bodily response, which is not quite under control. Breathing and blinking are two lovely examples of partially controllable physiological things. And then I think that very much came out of the works as well is to what extent people were aware or unaware of, of what was going on at, within their own bodies as well as within the experience itself. So it kind of sometimes, uh, 
yeah, people are kind of very fully aware what they're doing in their body. It's very conscious, very deliberate. They're choosing to act. They understand what the system's doing. Um, other points, they're blissfully unaware. And yeah, at times when we went through and documented the works and pieced up the interviews, we could give examples of where they had some shifting awareness. Okay, two dimensions. Computer scientists like that. We could do three, but that's going to get too complicated. We're just going to distill the world into a very simple story. Um, so let's put them together. Classic thing to do. This is a design space, a taxonomy, a way of thinking about what's going on that might just kind of challenge the, the normal view. So look, uh, if I put these two dimensions, I end up with four spaces I can think about. The extent of voluntary control. You've seen voluntary or not. Self-awareness. So yeah, the user is in control and they're aware of it. Uh, the user is not in control and they're not aware of it. Uh, the user becomes aware of the involuntary nature of their control. That's the peak, that's the peachy moment on the Bronco. Sudden awareness that you're not in control is a really powerful moment in an experience. So that's really, that's a design tactic that several artists we've worked with have used. And that's, that's provocative and interesting in experiential terms. And I think there's also, I had a, I got a bit of a beating up from some psychologists saying, you can't have anything in that top left space. How can you be voluntarily doing things and unaware of it? What kind of fool could do that? But I, I think that's about flow states and immersion. I think people who play computer games are still voluntarily pressing the buttons, even if they're thinking about some other level of it. Musicians who play the piano, they're doing that. And there is a kind of psychological notion of flow that explains kind of what's going on. So this is interesting because in my world, traditional computer science, everyday products, this is the line that everyone treads, okay? That the way you traditionally design a computer is this. Uh, if you're an undergraduate doing HCI, one of Bench and Eidemann's eight golden rules is the user shall be in control and drive what happens, and that's that. But we increasingly have autonomous systems, smart homes, vehicles, the top left. So that's, that's where the kind of industry is. And what's interesting to me is, you know, where artists are taking us is off of that picture. And they're, they're, there's alternate spaces. And that, that raises questions for, for interface design. I'll say one other thing, then I'll finish. I can play with my taxonomy more. Actually, all of these experiences are not about one kind of control. They all involve journeys through control. And I think that's really interesting. You know, in fact, we spent a lot of time writing about how, how so many of the performance works we've been involved in are about journeys. And so without explaining it in huge detail, we were able to chart the journeys that Brendan or some of, uh, sorry, Richard's, uh, Brendan's participants go on through the experience. And so the question is, you know, are some of these designed? I think this is designed by, by Brendan. Some of them are more accidental. He didn't necessarily expect people to hold on for dear life, but that's the journey they went on. And it was even more complicated from Richards. But what was clear that people were just in some series of loops being tipped back and forward between immersed in the film and then something would take them back to their sense of how they were controlling it and then they'd re-engage. And, and all the time they were kind of going around this cycle of, of a, a journey through, through kind of control. Well, I'm going to finish. I'm not sure I have any bigger conclusion than that. But I guess what I wanted to do was get down a bit into the detail and try and kind of, I suppose, kind of give the perspective of how it, how it looks, if you like, from a kind of computer science. Remember, that's not science uh, side of things. I will finish with um, a couple of plugs. Uh, so one is uh, Try, uh, Matt Collishaw's work, which is a Birmingham Museum opening tomorrow. So this is a piece of work done by the artist Matt Collishaw. Uh, recreating the world's first photographic exhibition in VR. But as you can see from this, there's a number of people in the set at the time, and all of the virtual world is recreated in some uh, physical form. This is kind of like the converse of Brendan's work. If Brendan's pushing for sensory misalignment, then Matt's pushing for maximal sensory alignment. So I think they're, they're both quite interesting. From my point of view, they're, they're looking at the same question, but through our very different lenses. So go try it. Opens Birmingham tomorrow. It's here for a few weeks, I think. Um, and finally, yeah, if you'd like to read, there's some papers and there's a book. Thank you. I thought at one point that the sudden realisation that you were not in control <laughs> was just the story of my life. <laughs> yeah. But, um, 
Some lovely reactions on Twitter, some people who have uh, really uh, appreciated that uh, presentation. So just in, for time's sake, I'm going to go straight to the audience so that we get your time rather than have a question from me. So who'd like to ask a question of our speaker? Anushka, right at the back. Thank you. It's always the people right at the back as well. That's fine. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. It's the hardest to throw things and be accurate from the back. Sorry about that. We are the no. naughty corner down here. Um, I, I thought uh, that presentation was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, just while you were talking and while you were showing all the, the sort of boxes and the, the, the charts and the different ways of losing control and the different factors, um, what struck me was um, uh, the idea of entanglement that these things are all entangled together mm -hmm. and there are different ways of seeing them, the different ways of separating them out become very interesting yeah. and become you know, uh, interesting ways of developing new projects, new innovations, like new creative processes, this kind of thing. So I suppose um, what I, the, the thought I had, and I was just really curious to get your comment on this, was that people undergoing these experiences that you were talking about, um, I wondered if um, they get to see themselves as part of an unfolding phenomena rather than I'm sitting here and I'm in control or I'm not in control and this is my relationship, but that somehow all of these are kind of entangled together, which would de uh, decenter, would be a kind of decentering mm -hmm. experience. So I'm part of something rather than either passive or active. Yeah. And, um, and I was just really, really curious about that because to me, uh, with a lot of the work that I do in education, I think that's a really interesting, critical experience to put someone through. Yeah. So, so think, then they can reflect really critically. I think, it, so. I think it varies. I mean, in, in Richard's work, quite a few people talked about it as being a co-creation thing. They felt they were editing or cutting or co-creating the film. I think in Brendan's work, I'm sure some people may feel that way, but to me it's much more akin to the roller coaster at the theme park. You do it because you want to surrender control. That, that is the point, and that's the thing with a roller coaster, is it's, it's the delicious feeling of the fear of not really not being in control. So I think I, think, I suspect people have different propositions. Also, it'd be very interesting to talk to you if we had time about Ulrika and Eamon Compliant, which was a, one of their works that explored that relationship and control Actually, with absolutely really minimal technology, all done through instructions in a locative experience. So there it was about voice and narrative and how that took control of people or didn't and, and, and played with them. So yeah, I think it varies. Um, but a lot of it is about, I think, provoking you, putting you in a, a somewhat uncomfortable space that, that opens you up emotionally to that reflection or, or that, that different encounter. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Oh. Next, next door, that's fine. Can I just ask you uh, about something in your abstract uh, where you mentioned... Uh, oh, yeah, because all of that was really concrete. No, that's not fair. No, you, that's not fair. It, really, I just want you to... Ex so, um, you mentioned interactive music composition. Mm, yes. and I was just wondering how that works I I in this uh, setup. Yes, um, okay, I, I'll happily show you a video afterwards. Didn't have time to talk about it. So, we, um, a couple of weeks ago, we just premiered a piece called Climb, and uh, how can I explain it very quickly? It's, uh, it's written as a classical, virtuoso classic composition, and it's composed and it's pre-scored, but we gave it a technology to let the composer embed codes into the music. So within the score are fragments that if they're recognized by the computer, it will cause things to happen. And the things that happen are jumping to another point in the score, so it's a non-linear non -linear piece, so which end, it's a bit like a choose-your-own-adventure book, which section or ending you play takes you. It also triggers audio effects, and it also triggers the piano, which is a disclavier, to play back and duet against the performance. So, so that's where you get this kind of very embodied conversation where you're playing some things, and then you're on the rails for a bit, and it's playing back at you, and you're having to play around it. And so on. So, I, yeah, if anyone wants to see it, I'd love to show a video afterwards. And maybe also, or, yeah, and sh maybe share a link if that's yeah, possible. Yeah, I'm very happy to. On the Twitter. Uh, time for one more question before a cup of, for an for a afternoon tea. Well, uh, that's the worst thing to say to a group of British people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one time. question between you and tea. <laughs> uh, seriously, because th this is your chance. Yes, thank you, Clayton. Give you my
Uh, I really like the idea of uh, you taking people outside of their comfort zones and outside of control. I just wonder, uh, from an ethical point of view, how you manage that. Um, yeah. Uh, so we had a, a long conversation about ethics over the years, and, and actually Blast Theory hosted uh, a, a workshop in Brighton about three or four years ago called Act Otherwise, where we got artists and... Uh, filmmakers and computer science and ethicists together to discuss that. We published a paper on the ethics of this stuff in a journal called ACM Transactions on Kai, which I'd encourage you to read, 50-page epic on what came out of it. Um, I mean, in a nutshell, uh, we, as university researchers, have to do our own ethical process to do research, and of course the artists we work with, if they're going to take their work to at least any credible, recognised venue, will have to do a form of ethical inspection too, however that's presented. I guess the argument we made was that uh, we, we try to gently argue against university ethics processes that are tend to be, to, to, to risk overgeneralizing, grounded in a medical and psychological model, which I could characterize as being you do a lot of thinking beforehand about all the things that go, could go wrong, and then once people are signed up, you don't talk to them again. Whereas I think in the kind of artistic world, yes, you do a lot of thinking beforehand, but because you're going to provoke and confront ethical issues, often in the work, and that's often the point, you want to do a lot of ethical work afterwards. So I think in the arts world, the important thing is to have the debates afterwards about what it was and provide channels for people to have that discussion. So if I had to give a simplistic answer, it would be, uh, yes, you need to do ethics, but it's ethics on the way out. Unless you're really doing something, maybe bioart, where there is seriously a risk of physically killing and injuring people. But if you're not, ethics on the way out. Yeah. So, torture them, really, just as long as you do a questionnaire afterwards. <laughs> kind of what I'm hearing here. I wish I'd, yeah, nice. <laughs> i just write that down. Yeah. Smiley face, Freya. <laughs> torture, frowny face. Um, Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, time for tea and coffee served again just outside the lecture theatre. I know when to go out. I know when to stay in. You can go out now, and can you please come and be back for 3.45. But again, before we do that, um, I hope it's been a breath-controlled thr thrill ride for you. Uh, can we all thank Steve for a fantastic presentation?